Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I start with apologies. I have a little bit of a Theresa May issue, so I might have to <laughs> cough in between. And uh, I hope there's nothing that can fall down behind me. Um, so it's late. It, it was a long day. And uh, I know I'm between uh, you and dinner, so I'll try to be brief and maybe incite your intellectual appetite for a little bit to make you forget your very real hunger. Um, so globalization and financial crisis, so I think what, what the organizers um, uh, didn't realize, or maybe you did uh, when you invited me, is that I've indeed worked on both topics. I've wor didn't done work on, as Heike just said, on, on globalization, on, on, on the, the growth or the absent growth effects of, of financial globalization and, and capital market integration. I've also worked on uh, protectionism and industry protection and its growth effects. And I've done a lot of work on financial instability in recent years, but I've never combined the two. So I've never sort of asked the question, how do globalization and financial crises um, sort of relate to each other. So grateful for the um, sort of opportunity to uh, rethink a little bit of what I've done and maybe, and, and you know, sort of think something new. And um, I can't solve all the questions, so I uh, decided to focus on two in today's um, uh, talk. Namely, the first one is, does globalization lead to more financial instability, and if so, why? That's, I guess, the question that uh, jumps up, but I also want to uh, turn the uh, chairs around and, and also ask the other question. You know, we're economists, we're interested in in sort of what causes what, um, and, and there's also obviously a potential for uh, things to go the other way, namely financial crisis might impact the process of globalization, and I also want to um, uh, talk about that for a little bit. Um, so let's start with the first. Um, I'm an empirical macroeconomist, so if I have to answer a question, what I do is I go to data and I find the data to answer a question. And I'm starting with something that we've done over the past years. Branko um, did some advertisement. Here's my part of advertisement, which is we've put together over the past years this uh, big macro history database, which is uh, you know, uh, available at our University of Bonn website, which you can use. It has all the real and financial credit, asset prices, inflation, all the indicators for about 17 uh, countries over almost 150 years. So this is very close to the universe of long-run macroeconomic data uh, that we have sort of, and, and the nice thing, and I promise this to you, like, unlike, I mean, it's all in one place, and unlike other sources, this really has very few gaps. So this is readily downloadable, and if you're interested in, you know, how the, um, uh, what the credit boom was in the 1920s, or how inflation evolved in the 1970s, uh, it's, uh, you can do it with that. So what I did is I went to this database, and first of all, looked at the frequency of financial crises in the long run. Um, added some data from Carmen and Ken's work, and what you see here is the frequency of, <coughs> and now Theresa May strikes, is, um, is the uh, frequency of financial crisis in high income and low income um, in countries. And you see there is, you know, it, it, it increases roughly up to the 1920s when we have this big spike in the depression where really a lot of countries are in a systemic uh, financial crisis. And then there's this period after World War II, these 30 years uh, where basically nothing happens and then crises come back in the past 20 years. So it is tempting to sort of correlate this frequency of crises with a chart from uh, the work that Maury and Ellen have done on sort of financial globalization. This is like, it's very rough here. This is just an idea like what is the amount of sort of financial flows across borders over time. And, and the story that Maury and Ellen tell is like there's been this first global financial globalization peaking roughly in 1914 and then this sort of U shape uh, with very low amounts of sort of um, cross-border financial flows and low stocks of foreign investment after World War II and then we have this re-globalization uh, in the past uh, 30, 40 years. The exact shape of that curve is not, you know, is not important here. This is very rough. It just goes from low to high. Uh, but the important point is that U curve and uh, you might say like, well, you know, something, there's something low in the 50s, 60s, 70s and something, there's no crisis here. So there is a correlation. So, but then, you know, we, we, correlations are, especially if it's just, if they're just concerned two times series, it's always a little bit tricky to infer much. And, you know, there's, there's another thing that, I, um, that happens in these 30 years after World War II, which looks so special. Namely, um, I show you, what, what you see here is for the uh, entire banking system, especially, um, of, in, in particular, of the advanced economies since 1870s, the liability structure. So what's on the liability side of a bank, of a bank's balance sheet, there's capital, uh, there's deposits which banks use to finance themselves, and there's all kinds of other 
and what we call here non-core liabilities. Think of this as borrowing in money markets, um, short-term bond issues, repos, etc. So if you, if you track the long-run development of the uh, liability side of the banking sector, you will uh, come across the, or you, you we will see something, which of course is very closely linked to the incidence of financial crisis, systemic banking crisis, namely that after World War II, in these 30 years, we introduced deposit insurance in most countries. So the, if, you, if you think about what is the like, amount of runnable debt, you know, debt that is short term, where um, people get, could get worried and run through the door, and then you know, the door is not big enough for everyone to get through at the same time, so you have the typical bank run, banking panic situation. Uh, before World War II, there was plenty of uninsured deposits. There was a lot more capital. I mean, this kind of, you know, problem that made, made the system uh, workable at all. But there's plenty of, like, if you add up the, the deposits and the non liabilities, none of this is insured essentially in the U.S. before the, the Great Depression and the 1933 introduction of deposit insurance. And in most other countries, not until you know, sort of after World War II, when explicitly or implicitly most countries... Um, adopted deposit insurance scheme. So what happens after World War II is that from one sort of within a relatively short time period, the only runnable debt that was left in the system is this is this small, very small red part here because all the deposits were insured. So the the potential for like short term funding crisis in the banking system in these thirty years was very low. You know, you might also add that in these years growth was very strong in most European countries, and that might have papered over a lot of the. Uh, financial instability issues, but what has happened after 1980 is that, of course, we keep deposit insurance, but this big share, the, the, the share of non-insured short-term funding, money market funding, interbank lending, repo markets, grows enormously. It's almost as big as the deposit funding of banks now. So what's the point here? The point is something else is special about these 30 post-World War II years, so let's not jump too quickly to conclusions that it's all about the absence of globalization. Okay, so I guess the holy grail of macrofinance is why do financial crises happen? Um, and if we want to answer how does globalization relate to that, we need to, um, answer, we need to have sort of a causal idea about what's, what's going on, what are really the ultimate origins of financial instability. Um, and in, in, in my work, um, we have, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a, if, you, if you want to predict, if you, if you put yourself in the position of an econometrician and say, like, what I care about is predictive power, then it's very clear what is sort of the best early warning system or an indicator for financial crisis. It's credit growth. Yeah? So uh, the, the evidence in current accounts is much less compelling, has to do with the fact that both the borrowers and the lenders get into trouble in financial crises. But of course, like predicting a crisis is not the same as understanding the causes. It's still useful. You know, think about hurricane forecasts. I mean, we have no idea why the hurricane is forming, but we see on the satellite map that the hurricane is moving to the coast, uh, and we want to take precautionary measures. The same here for the credit boom, as, or credit growth as an early warning indicator, but we don't know why people all of a sudden are borrowing so much, why people all of a sudden are lending so much. Yeah? So for predictive purposes, that's clear, and I'll show you some charts here coming actually from that database that I advertised at the beginning. Uh, from 1870, this is for the UK, this is for Sweden, this is for Denmark, for the US. This is credit to GDP, and you see and these red lines, and there's gray bars here which mark systemic financial crisis in these countries, and you see that pattern. Let's look at Sweden, you have this massive run-up in credit to GDP, big credit boom, and then there's a crisis, there's some deleveraging, and there's a next run-up in credit, and there's a next crisis. And you see that here for, the, for Denmark, or for the US in the 1920s, or for the UK. Yeah, so, but that doesn't tell us why uh, credit is all of a sudden accelerating so much. So if you then <laughs> go a little bit deeper and ask, so what causes credit booms, what causes then ultimately what leads to the crisis, there's two views out there. And that's heavily reductionist, but I think like, it's fair to summarize. Most of mainstream models that you know, today have a lot of financial frictions, I think there's been some learning in the, in the, in the profession, um, have a friction, a financial friction that's, that's based on incentive and agency problems. Call this the capital view. That means like the, the, the bankers, they have too little skin in the games, they have an incentive to take excessive risks, and we get these sort of excessive, or these periods of excessive risk taking through credit booms, um, because, you know, it's the, it's the uh, heads I win, tails you lose. There's a, there's a sort of li limited liability put option for the bankers, so they run these big risks, uh, because they, at, at most they can lose their equity, but not cover the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the losses that 
emerge. The other view, and that's very popular, I think that's the, that's, that's the mainstream, you know, the, the, if, if something goes wrong in rational expectations model, it must be because of some incentive moral hazard problem, right? Um, the other view is, is one that you're very familiar with, uh, which is kind of the minsky kindleberger view, which is more behavioral story, if I may say that. That means that crises are caused by spurts of credit field mispricing of assets, and then they get suddenly repriced. Think about U.S. real estate. You know, things you know, get blown up for almost a half a decade, and then all of a sudden people have the Minsky moment and realize these assets are mispriced. Uh, they fall sharply in value, and, um, and banks are in trouble. And there are some models recently, Genioli, Schlaff, and Vishni have a nice QJE paper, Baron Stone is a very good QJE paper that recently came up. Recommend to read that, which apparently essentially makes the point that um, bankers themselves, or the equity holders of banks, I should say, also don't, don't require higher risk premia to hold bank stocks in credit booms, although they should. Yeah? Because you know, the re if, you, if you observe a credit boom, you know that the risk for the banks are increasing to go bust or have a, have a crisis down the road or go. Um, but, and that should, like a rational investor should say, well, for that risk, I want to be compensated. I require higher equity risk premium for the, holding bank stocks in that situation. Um, and Barron and, and, and so they test it and find, no, they don't. The, the, the conclusion is that so investors are essentially you know, unresponsive to that. They're caught in the same heuristic bubble. They also believe that the U.S. housing market is the greatest investment out there or Internet stocks or whatever. So there is no indication that the market generally sees that coming. Then the interpretation is, yeah, okay, then obviously we're all caught in the bubble mentality. And um, crises are largely orthogonal to that capital. So everyone's really caught in the same uh, mental state. And if anything, then in these sort of causal models, in these explanations, liquidity matters, right? If, if there's a liquidity backstop, then the, um, the fire sales and the banking panics, the runs on the bank don't get as bad. So where does globalization come in? Oh, no, let me, let me give you one chart here to, to give you an idea what, where I think we're going in this debate. This shows you the development of the capital ratio of banks. The year zero, year, year zero is the year when the crisis breaks out. Yes, across all countries over all these years. And you see capital ratios going into the crisis and then going out of the crisis. And what you see is you don't see anything. So it's not the case that before the crisis, banks lever up uh, enormously. And there's hardly any change. Like, you would want to see that, right? If the capital view, if it's all about incentive and agency problems, you would want the capital ratio to kind of decline going into crisis as bankers are leveraging up, trying to, like, get maximum profits from that or maximum um, value from that limited liability. But there's, there's hardly any movement. In the minsky kindleberg world, I think what you want to see is, is, like, is an expansion of general lending because people get very optimistic about some profit opportunities, some investment opportunities. And that's what you see on the right-hand side. Assets to GDP are really growing strongly, whereas not much is happening on capital. So now the question, where does globalization fit in? Well, <coughs> I think there, there, there's definitely interactions. Um, so international capital flows provide the fuel for the fire of credit booms. You know, if we look at subprime, if we look at reserve accumulation, global imbalances, there's no doubt about that. Uh, international lending booms can also set domestic leverage cycles in motion. I think this is a little bit the idea that uh, Barbara mentioned with the boom and bust cycles. And then clearly we have global financial intermediaries that transmit and amplify financial crises. So conclusion here would be there's some role for international factors in making economic, economies more crisis prone, especially in, in emerging markets. But I come away thinking like the ultimate causes for financial stability are likely elsewhere. Yeah, they are found in behavioral mistakes, they are found maybe in incentive problems if you want to go down that route. But um, overall, I think like globalization is, is, is sort of is, 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 some, is, is, is in, in larger transmitter, something that makes the effects um, of, of sort of pre-existing issues stronger. It doesn't really sort of play an independent role. So let me come to the second question. What about crises and globalization? How do crises affect the globalization process? And, um, well, the first very simple take on that question is, well, what happened to globalization after pick a crisis? Let's take the last one. Um, here, uh, the 2008 global financial crisis. Uh, what I show here is the, the, the cross-sectional correlation between domestic saving and investments, generally known as the feldstein horioka idea, you know, in a perfect capital market, the savings and investments could be decoupled in a uh, um, sort of in a, in a perfectly autark, financially autark system, domestic investment must by definition equal 
um, domestic savings. So you can track in a cross-section how closely savings and investments are correlated. If the correlation goes towards zero, you say like, okay, this is really financially integrated global economy. If um, the correlation is close to one, you say like, well, there isn't that much financial globalization going on. And what you see here very nicely is uh, how in the night, from the 1990s until 2008, you know, we start with a very high correlation, less sort of <coughs> relatively little capital mobility, and then we go almost to zero, very high integration, decoupling of savings and investment, and we jump right back to where we are now after the crisis, in, b b right back to the 1980s to where we started. So clearly financial globalization has, I don't want to say collapsed, but it has taken a massive step back after the crisis. But I think if we look around, um, the main effect of the crisis is maybe not so much, maybe we're not even too, um, not too much worried about this side of the crisis. It has a lot to do with the renationalization of banks, etc. But we're more uh, worried about this effect of the crisis. And, um, and I think, and, and I will try to convince you that this is actually what we've seen since 2008 in terms of political radicalization, in terms of rise of uh, populism and nationalism, is not a novel phenomenon, but it's something that um, you observe in, um, in, in, in often in, in crisis situations. So what we've done, and, and just, to, just to frame your ideas, with the idea is well, what do crises do to the process of globalization? And a lot of these people clearly are not happy with globalization, are trying to um, 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 cut it short. Um, so what we've done in the recent papers, we've tried to systematically study the political after effects of, of systemic banking crisis, of systemic financial crises. And um, sort of, and the, the bottom line is uh, to use, I think it's, is, was it Calvo's line, um, to, uh, the bottom line is to say it's goodbye financial crisis, hello political crash. Because what we find is that after the after financial crisis, the political landscape changes systematically. That comes out of these 800 general election results, 20 countries, it's, you know, it's pretty much, again, the universe of what you can look at. Um, and um, so one of the key results is, is, is probably one that um, maybe, I don't know if you're surprised, it's what we call the tragedy of the left in the paper. Namely, in a systemic financial crisis, if you will, when capitalism lies on its back and is like, like a bug and can't move anymore, not even then is uh, sort of the time, or not, that's definitely not the time when the, uh, the left does well politically. So what this shows here are the vote shares of, um, of I have to say, of far left parties. No, I'm not, we're not talking about sort of moderate left of center parties. So these are the vote shares pre and post crisis of far left, that's the white, of far right, that's the black, and the, the, the adding them up, so they're adding up the extremes of, um, of both far left and far right parties. And what you say, there's, first of all, is, there's a massive increase in the vote share of, um, of extremist parties, but it's almost entirely due to the electoral successes of far right wing parties. Um, what else is that after these, these impulse responses, if you will, they show you how the government vote share zero is always the year of the financial crisis. And these, the, these lines track how the government vote share, the opposition vote share, the number of parties in parliament and the fractionalization of parliament behave after sort of indexing the series to zero. It's a little bit more complicated, but essentially that's the story. And tracking how these um, indicators develop after the start of the crisis in the one, two, three, four, five years after. And what we see, government vote shares drop, um, the opposition vote shares goes up, so there's more, there's more sort of, you know, less clear majorities, fractionalizations of parliament, you think of the latest German elections, goes up massively, um, and so does the number of parties in parliament. So we, 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 <coughs> we find that um, crises and disappointment with elites gives rise to populism, political polarization, that the political right is, the, is by far the biggest beneficiary, and that what's really typical is that rise of right-wing populism, because they're very, the, the right-wing, the, the far right is very effective in blaming other groups for what has gone wrong. And people clearly see um, financial crisis as man-made disasters and they want to find someone who's responsible. Um, importantly, in terms of, you know, thinking about the, the sort of economics and the identification, we do not find the same effects in equally severe non-financial economic disasters. Think of terms of trade shocks. Think of big um, reversals in, 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 in sort of export revenues. Think about natural disasters. In all of these other severe economic crises where the output drop or the consumption drop is as severe as, as after a financial crisis, um, similar 
reactions, political radicalization are not uh, observable. So there's something very specific and special about a financial crisis. Okay, so what happens then is the next step for my last five minutes or so, is that correct? Um, yes. Is, um, <coughs> is to ask, okay, so after crises, populists, nationalists do well. Uh, this chart here tracks the share of developing, I should say, countries with populist governments since 1900. And we're clearly like at, at last five to ten years at an all-time high here. Um, what happens when these populists get into power? You know, think about Trump or uh, others being uh, at the hands of government. What, is, what do they do? That's an ongoing research project. I can just show you some, give you some first ideas and relate them to the question that I'm kind of still after, namely, what do crises do to the process of globalization? Um, so this is, the, this is the timeline of, of how many populists are in power, and it's like quite a lot now. Um, and we, like one question is to ask, how do financial markets react? And what do populists do once they're in power? And that's what we study in this, what we study in this paper. And the, the, the result is, and it was surprising to me, it was that the, the, the financial markets are not unhappy. Um, on average, they react quite positively. So the Trump rally, um, that we've seen since, since last November uh, is, is no exception. Um, Maybe against conventional wisdom, but financial markets often embrace populist agendas and, and we certainly shouldn't bank on financial markets, so some idea of market discipline to keep them in check. Here's the, here's the proof, if you believe me. These are stock markets. This is zero, again, is the year of the populist government takeover. This is for all years. This is pre-World War II. This is Latin America. You know, that used to be the the main region where populism was supposed to happen, it's no longer, um, 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 no longer true. We have, it's, it's, it's right in, in, in Washington as well. Um, and post-1985. The story is always the same. Um, I look at post-1985, maybe because that's the populist episodes that we're all most uh, familiar with. Um, in year zero, the dotted line is when the populists take over, and the red line is, this, is the average of the stock market in that country relative to, this is the black line, relative to global index. You know, we're going to do this, we're going to identify this more cleanly in, in, in future work, but it's clear that populist stock markets in countries with populist governments uh, outperform the global index after the, uh, the populist government. Yeah, so there's no idea that like the markets, what happened to Trump and, and, and world markets or the American markets in the past year or so is not, is not an exception. Raising the question why do markets like populist? Well, um, sometimes the economic record is not a disaster. Sometimes the policies work. Um, the economies recover. Populists also just catch the upswing. Um, I want to be really careful here, but there is, um, there is it, the, the, the economic record doesn't seem to be a disaster. But I think like, there's, there's much more direct political economy reasons. Populist policy is often a boon for national companies. Uh, public spending may boost demand. Protectionism reduces competition. Um, and, and maybe and importantly, in linking to, to what's been said before, Populists clearly after crisis, cr post-crisis times are a time of sort of high distributional struggles. And especially right-wing populists minimize the, and I think we see that with Trump and, and the tax reforms debated right now, they, re they, they, they re minimize the risk or reduce the risk that these distributional struggles are solved in a way that hurts big business. Okay, the main victim of populist takeovers, and that's kind of in, in, sort of in conclusion, at least in, in, in so far, is not so much the economy, it's democracy. Clearly, after populist takeovers, the same story, the polity four score for um, democratic accountability um, in the ICRG scores go down uh, quite substantially. OK, let me, let me sum up, and um, yeah, I'll be in time. The two views of globalization out there. There's a liberal view, an idealist view, going back all the way to John Stuart Mill in 1848, which is, Globalization is a beneficial, self-reinforcing, uh, wealth-enhancing process. It's sort of self-stabilizing, and um, the more we trade with each other, the more we increase sort of the linkages, financial or real, between countries, um, the more secure uh, the whole process will be. There's also a realist view, which is that globalization always contains the seeds of its own destruction. Uh, one is. Um, one has been talked about by, by Branko excellently just a few minutes ago, namely that globalization polarizes the income distribution. The second one is, it, if you think about China and, and Trump is just being there in Beijing, um, you know, globalization also leads to the rise of new powers 
um, that challenge the existing order. And the third point is the, the one I talked about in the, at the very beginning. It brings contagious, you know, it brings contagion and, and in, countries import financial instability from abroad. So <coughs> I think this, looking at what's been happening recently, this realist view certainly is the one that uh, we need to take seriously. And um, if we go back to the very first questions that are raised in the introduction, um, what's the relationship between globalization and crisis? Well, it's clearly a two-way street. Yeah? <laughs> globalization can spread financial contagion and magnify financial vulnerabilities. But then, and I hope I've been with my uh, little run through the history of, of populism, um, crisis and the after effects also trigger the political turns that threaten an open international order. So the, uh, we really have a two-way um, two um, relationship. Um, and uh, my uh, overall conclusion is this is the second channel. It's the risks that come from crises and the political polarization, uh, the, the uh, emergence of, of, of um, sort of right-wing nationalism and populism. That's the, uh, the, the clear and, and, and clear and present danger uh, today. That was, thank you very much.